Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the last week of January. I am actually just catching up with January. So let's take a moment as we are practicing to release everyone and everything to Jesus so that our time together can be a sacred space and a space where we meet God. Jesus, we do, we do release everyone and everything to you. And Jesus, we ask you for union. We ask you for oneness, Lord. Meet us in the podcast here this very moment. Let this be connection time with you. Come and speak to us. Come and meet us, God, for it is you that we need. Friends, I'm excited about this week's podcast. I have in the studio Morgan and Sherry Snyder with me this week. Hey, guys. Hi, John. Hey, good to be with you, buddy. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. Morgan, as you know, is the VP of Discipleship here at Wild at Heart and runs some of our deeper track stuff. Sherry is on the Captivating Women's Team and is in grad school these days. Mm -hmm. What are you working on, Sherry? Last semester, I took Theological Foundations of Counseling, and I told Morg it was like the course that I felt like I've been looking for my whole life. I mean, that's sort of overstated, but I say that really intentionally. It was awesome. And then um, this semester is Counseling Theory. So you're in school to become a therapist? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, Listeners, let me tell you why the three of us are here this week, and, and it's because of something that Morgan said to me, I think it was a year ago, it may be two years yeah. ago now, but it had such traction that it, it has stuck with me, and it circled back around in this hour. Now, if you listened to us last week, we were talking about vulnerable places, and I think that this conversation is just going to fit hand in glove with that, because the... The phrase that you shared with me, and I think it, I think it was out of like a counseling mm -hmm. context or something, you said that today's expectations are tomorrow's resentments or something like that, yes. that today's expectations set us up for tomorrow's resentments. Mm -hmm. And like, I was so arrested by that and a little busted by it personally. Yeah. It, it, it was one of those phrases that stuck yes. and I've molded over... And and I want to circle back around to it, and I have you guys in because I think it's been helpful to you. I think it's been a category that's been meaningful. Where did that begin? Where did that come from? Yeah, John, I do remember. It was a long time ago talking to you about it. But where it began, I was sitting with a therapist who's also a mentor, and he offered that idea that today's expectations are tomorrow's resentments. And I found myself reacting, going, no, these are reasonable. These are legitimate <laughs> expectations. You don't understand, right? And then I could be aware of myself and going, what is behind that? Why am I defensive right now? Why am right I now? defensive? Yes. So just by way of unpacking it as an introduction, I'll just start with this morning. So uh, about two hours ago, we were in the kitchen and I was unloading dishes. And I had this really beautiful, winsome moment with just the Holy Spirit going, we've come a long way, haven't we? Like me and God in this space. And this space was- In the kitchen in the unloading kitchen, dishes space? Unloading dishes space. Because we're 22 years in. And for many years, I harbored unspoken resentment for everything I do in the kitchen of unloading dishes, of washing dishes. And- you know, Jesus, forgive me. And, oh, I want to love my wife and I want to bless my wife and all these things, but they didn't touch. Why do I have so much resentment? Mm. And what I realized, and now, and this is self-compassion, I grew up in a household. My dad was a doctor. And so he was not home. When he was home, he was sleeping. That's basically my childhood memory, other than a week vacation every year. He wasn't home. The only time in my childhood, like the first 15 years I ever saw my dad do anything in the kitchen other than sit at the table and eat was on Thanksgiving. 
he would help a little bit bringing plates from the dining room and maybe even like once or twice trying to wash until he got kicked out. And just the idea was the expectation in my house was dad, husband, was never in the kitchen. And so what's so interesting is there was this resentment that was actually really unfounded. It's very reasonable that as one of the couple leading this home, loving these kids and managing chaos, that I would be helpful. But just the the interesting correlation. Yeah, I had an expectation, unspoken, even um, unaware, that I wouldn't ever work in the kitchen. And therefore, I harbored a resentment that was, and, and I'm sure, share that affected you in different times and different stages. Um, and I'd be curious to know if it did. But the reality is it was an expectation that was actually deeply um, fueling a resentment. Yes. And an un, would we call it an unconscious expectation? Abso- absolutely. Because I wouldn't have put words to, and even if you would have said to me, does a man ever help in the kitchen? And I would say, of course, that's the loving thing to do. But in my actual body experience, I had an unconscious expectation that led to a resentment that took quite some time to understand what was operating. And why did the counselor bring this up? What was he after? Well, I mean, this dives pretty deep, but it tied to where we were then in a marriage intensive. And I found myself um, diminishing expectation to feel well. So I'll just shrink expectations to feel good Mm. in the marriage because Mm. I was feeling some disappointments in different areas. And I dwindled it down to like, I'm just asking for these four things from you. And I'm feeling very embarrassed now even saying it, but I felt very justified because I took this whole body of expectation and said, all I need are these four things. And the counselor looked at Sherry and said, and you don't have to do any of those. You are released from expectation. And something in me, and it was a very young place, was livid going, no, you don't understand. (laughs) These are legitimate. I deserve it. I'm not asking for much. And here's the idea is by actually, and this is so important, by diminishing seemingly expectations down to just a few things, I was actually just strengthening the resolve of needing those expectations met and therefore increasing resentment. And in a long story short, in this fall, God did some profoundly deep healing for me internally, having nothing to do with share with our marriage, as you know, but deep identity work. Mm. And from that place, I realized I actually don't have to diminish expectations. I need I need to crucify them. Mm. I need to relinquish them because the actual holiness of marriage is I have covenantally surrendered my rights and I'm okay. Mm. I'm okay. Like my heart is safe. It's in God. I'm well. And I don't need anything external to be well. And what's so beautiful is when those expectations went from really big to seemingly small to actually crucified and consecrated to God, then I was free to receive and free to give Mm. in a way where she was released from this brutal role I put her in that was simply unconscious. A lot of times it was even unspoken. So it freed me dramatically and and it's been working wonders in our marriage. I think the word unspoken is important. Did you feel these share or were they operating beneath the surface? So I can I can definitely say the last four months since Morgan received this, I mean, I I really have had to acknowledge what that pressure has felt like and the sense of futility because of the things that I had that I longed to offer to him since they didn't, Mm. they weren't these four things. They seemingly counted for nothing. And then these four things had so much intensity around them and just that it had affected, affected me so profoundly. And obviously fed in, you know, one of the reasons it affected me so much I take responsibility for because of areas of vulnerability in me and areas of lack of, 
you know, had I had a stronger voice earlier on, I could have been like, what's up with the, like these four things, like where he has suffered from not having a wife with a stronger voice is in this, you know, that that we could have grown through this sooner. I just want to acknowledge as part of my growth curve yes. that 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 was slower than I wish it were. But point being yes. is that um, just to feel, I can feel the freedom. And even this morning when he was unloading the dishwasher, I could feel like my body get a little tense because it's still, I remember like, because Morgan's mom, and to this day, I, I don't think she's ever missed a morning where she comes and the first thing she does is she unloads the dishwasher. Like, yeah, you can set your clock by it yeah. you know, proverbially. And so yeah. that that isn't like, I don't necessarily come down and do that very, very first thing. Um, anyways, point yeah. being is that it's been huge and I've just been really proud of Morgan. And obviously it's something that I've appreciated about him since we met, but his transparency when he does have something's illuminated him he's so transparent about it and so it's sweet to hear you describe it today and describe it publicly it does feel really meaningful well, it's so hopeful to watch like healing is possible maturing is available Tra- transformation is what this gospel's about because genuinely this morning i'm unloading the dishes and i'm almost like smiling with god of going yeah i remember when i used to be really pissed off doing this yes. and now like yes i feel great i'm glad to be helpful yes. like look how far we've come yeah. i'm actually mm-hmm. even enjoying yeah being different than my dad yeah. in this space to be honest yeah Okay, so I'm I'm in the position of a listener right now, and I'm fascinated at watching my internal world because I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> I I get it that there are unrealistic expectations, but mine are not. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm the exception. <laughs> this is the exception. Yes, like my right. my expectations are completely reasonable. So can you give me a practical example of one that you can think of right now that you go, no, this one falls in that category of, no, this is legitimate. Well, I was telling you guys before the show that the funny conversation this morning in the in the house in our marriage was reupholstering chairs. And <laughs> and honestly, I I really am something of a monk. I live a pretty ascetic life. Now, I love beauty. I love beauty. I love goodness. I love having a lovely home. I love having it so that my wife feels happy in our home. I think that's all good. I'm I'm for that. But I could also let it all go in a moment. Yes. Right? And my expectation is, well, so should you. This shouldn't be a big deal. Why is this a big deal this morning? can't believe we're having to talk through fabric at seven o'clock in the morning when I want to get on with my day. Okay. (laughs) So I can feel the what the what the. Yes in me, right? And the expectation, I'm now being forced to name it, is why can't you be as fluid as me? Why can't you be as open-handed as me? Now, I am not excusing this uh, as righteous. I'm just aware of, uh uh-oh. Yeah, there's a because it comes down to, and Stace and I will laugh about this all the time, no, 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 my, my way is the right way. And if the world would all do my way, this would be a happy, peaceful planet. Like we'd be great. It's that, Mm -hmm. right? Whatever is driving or how you act in public or what you wear or all that set of, no, these unspoken assumptions of, I have found the right way to live. Everybody get with the program, right? John, I guess I am, I am curious though, you know, one of my um, names for you affectionately is Abbott and this idea that of, of the wild at heart tribe being sort of a virtual monastic movement. Yeah. I am curious if maybe we could use as a rescue from our age, a little more of the instruction on asceticism as, as a rescue, as a, as a lifeline out of the um, tumult of, of these maybe what we might call more like domestic expectations. And I don't mean domestic in a, just within the home, but I, I guess I mean as in yes. daily yes. life. So yes. I, I can tell you, by, I'm at attention when I hear you describe that. And part of me is like, take but us wait, with that's you. That's helpful. Take yes. us with you. <laughs> yes. Anyways. Okay. okay. So folks, what, 
this whole pattern of expectations, especially unquestioned and even unconscious Mm -hmm. expectations, really do set us up for resentments, uh, misunderstanding, anger, um, I'm going to take my ball and go home, pouting, all that. It does set us up for that. It really does. And this is going to take some unpacking because we're not saying that desires are wrong. Desire is the human heart. You you cannot escape desire. Stace and I were on a marriage podcast yesterday, someone else's podcast on an interview, and and he was trying to get people to long for more in their marriage. And I laughed. And I'm like, oh, no, you don't understand. You do long for more in your marriage. It's just where are you taking it? Mm. How is that being expressed? Mm. Because right now it's probably anger mm. and pouting, mm. right? Or indulgences and that, you know, I'm going to go on my vacation. I'm going to go ride my bike. I'm going to go do my thing. You do your thing, right? So the human heart is longing. The human heart is desire. But what we're talking about is when things like resentment show up, Mm -hmm. anger, sullenness, I'm going to punish you with silence, you know, all that. Then you go, "Uh uh-oh, my desires have shifted from longing for something more in my life to demand. Mm. Right? Would that help? Yes. And the problem is this, what Sherry was pointing at is we have all been raised now, nearly all of us listening to this with the exception of those, you know, maybe 75 and above, we have been raised in a phenomenally comfortable environment in the world. If you're in the developed world anywhere, your life has been remarkable. You have medical care, you have education, you can do, you can buy a house from your phone. <laughs> like it, it's just, it's unbelievable what you can do, right? The, the ease with which, and I can see my expectations in it when I turn my computer on and I am pissed if it does not get on the internet in like three seconds. <laughs> Right? Like just yeah. the irritation. Oh. Right. Even the expectation of upgrade, yes. right? It's only going to get better, right? From the couch to yes. someone sent me a text yesterday saying there's this new platform. By the time this podcast published, this will probably be, you know, old news, but there's a new platform saying Google is archaic and dreadfully slow. And there's this new thing blowing Google out of the waters. It's set all these records for millions of downloads in its first four days. And you just go, Google? is too slow. Right. Right. We're, we're right. conditioned. Yes, the madness we're conditioned of it. for this comfort. And, we are. And, and therefore, expectations feel very legitimate. They Well, they, it really sets us up for it, yeah. that life yes. is going to be easy. Yes. And when life isn't easy, accessible, comfortable, rewarding, yes. yeah. da, 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 yeah. da, yes. then I'm mad. And so within a marital context, the idea of, ooh, my unspoken expectations are burdening this relationship with pressure is a really helpful category. Absolutely. And it's a helpful treasure trail to get to where, where is this rooted? Yes. Right? Where's this coming from? Yes. Because every resentment is a doorway to go. Like I noticed the pattern of it's so often rooted in lack Mm. or in some sort of unspoken need that has nothing to do with the marriage, Mm. right? But there's something in my soul, it's either a lack or a need. And if we can get curious to go, like, what is it that you really want? Or what is it that you really need? Mm. It very quickly leads you into the heart of God and the space of of the work of becoming a wholehearted human. Mm. Have you guys seen how this pattern of expectation setting up resentment or sullenness or anger or in other places? Have you seen it operate in relationships with kids, with the world? John, as you say that, I mean, I can just tick through, like, name a category where this isn't operating, mm. right? From from chasing joy and adventure and a a recreational pursuit, you oh, know? I, uh, actually, I was just thinking about hunting. Oh, my gosh. You want to go there? Well, I mean, the number of times that <laughs> oh. you go out, and again, the set of desires 
are beautiful. Right. I really want this to be adventure. I want it to be great. We hope for success. But then there's some sort of shift yes. where now I'm mad. Right. That it's not going well. <laughs> totally. Right? <laughs> right. Your soul is tied to some sort of outcome, right? And well is defined as what? It's either defined as a harvest. It's the outcome. Right? Exactly. Yes. Or we at least need weather to cooperate. We only have four days yes. and we did everything to protect yes. these four days, right? The, yes. That sort of example. But we put a pressure on it. Yeah. And, but I think from, from you know, all the categories of friendship, of things like our finances and our homes to to maturing our kids and, and shepherding their initiation into adulthood. I, I think I mean, it's pretty poignant. Um, I recall my relationship with Abigail. You know, each kid is so unique and there is so not different. a one size fits all. Totally. And there are tendencies towards the genders and, and there's issues with birth order, but at the end of the day, every child is utterly unique. And so- my heart in parenting my daughter, the intention was to love well, love deeply, and participate with what God was doing. That was my heart's intention. But what I didn't become aware of until it blew up was I really did have a set of expectations of how it should go, what it would look like, how our relationship would be, what I would offer, and how she would respond to it. Yes. And I didn't know. I'm a first-time parent to a teenage daughter. And she did not respond towards what I was offering in the way that I thought, and let me be really clear, the way I thought she should. Oh, yeah. Right? Come There's on. the expectation. I'm doing my best. I'm trying. This on. is for you, right? Yes. And what people would give to have what I'm oh, offering. The oh, the only people yes. I want to trade lives yes. with are my kids and now my dog, right? They have the best lives. <laughs> No, my dogs have the best life. They're so <laughs> freaking spoiled. It's that is another podcast. And you come to this precipice where you realize it's not working. I have resentment. Yes. That resentment is directly tied to expectations that I didn't even know I carried. And again, similar to the marriage there was a process and this was over two years and this was lots of therapy and internal work. I mean, we're giving you the distilled moments here, but it was a relinquishing mm. of my expectations mm. and saying love expects nothing in return. And it required a unlearning. It required a dying to even dreams. Like, to come face to face with that of going, I have to give it all up. Mm. And then from that place, Sherry, I think you helped me see like, it's only there that I could really tune into her heart. And for example, she came out of multiple counseling sessions where I finally got to be with her counselor. And I said, what do I do? Help me. And the counselor said, there's one thing you can do right now. And I was like, great. You know, and she said, give her space. And it, it was just like this moment of death. Mm. So I'm like, I have so much I want to offer you. And you're saying, give her space. Mm. But that required Christ in me. That was the one thing that I couldn't do without Jesus of Nazareth alive in my being. Yes. And the fruit over time. Yes. Because to do the thing I didn't know, I didn't believe, I didn't agree with, against my expectations, the fruit was that her heart found safety. Her heart felt validation. Her mm. heart felt like she was seen. And she really believed that I would do the impossible for her. Mm. And then she let me in. Mm. And so, yeah, that's in every arena. I see it, this deep uh, pattern at play. Yeah. Yeah. C can we take this even closer to home? Because the phrase that I'm feeling, I'm aware of is, come on, God. Come on, God. Like it, it's when it's when the expectation turns, and I again I don't know I have them until the resentment, sullenness, pouting, anger, rage, uh, walk away, pull away, whatever the reaction is. Then I see it, and I go, "Uh oh, H have you have you guys noticed this with God? 
John, as I've been reflecting on this, I was brought to a moment um, actually around um, Morgan's brother Lance's passing. And so this is April 2012, and um, Lance was in hospice, and we came, the children and I, Morgan was already there. We It was interesting. We arrived on Monday, Thursday. I see him for the first time on Good Friday. He's he's in a hospital bed. And I remember coming home from that, texting several people who were praying, and it's like, you guys, I just, I, I still have faith God could heal him. And I, what I was gripped by was that story where Jesus comes to to Lazarus' grave, and Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mm. And I had such a conviction, like, if Jesus comes into this space with resurrection power, Lance will not die. Just mm. like had Jesus visited yes. Mary and Martha earlier, Lance wouldn't have died. Mm. Like, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Mm. And um, I just was like, Lord, you are the resurrection and the life. Like, I was remembering Martha's confession, and I I, I felt like her. Like, I was at his feet. Like, I—, I if you had scanned my personhood, I I had full faith. I genuinely feel that way. And I have not had full faith often in my life. You know, that's not, but in this time I did. And um, and then the timing, obviously, of like we were literally over Easter weekend. I was like, this is the most incredible story. This would just be yes. amazing. Yes. And a week later on Friday, uh, Friday week from that, Lance died. And, um, you know, it really just, set me on a journey of, okay, God, you know, what, what was that? Like, in this case, it wasn't for lack of faith. Yes. And I can say, you know, 12 years later, um, I can just see where um, Jesus has, has met me in that. And um, I think a huge part for me that has been a, a rescue from resenting God was I, I feel like Jesus has kindly, and obviously I'm very blessed. I get to go to Captivating on a regular basis, but just reminded me where we are in the larger story, that we are in act three and not act four. And we, you know, we are still in Eden lost, Eden being recovered, but not Eden like fully restored that heaven and earth are not yet one. And um, recently I was at a funeral, actually about a year ago, of a, of a mom my age, four kids, who died and we had, she had had a, um, she died of cancer. She'd had kind of a um, resuscitation, if you will, a couple days before she passed. And we were praying and like, oh my gosh, God, this is, and she died. And I was at her service. I'm just weeping, Lord. And um, the, the sermon given was so orienting for me. And it was a reflection on, is it John Christostom? Christostom. Christostom. Mm-hmm. And his reflections on um, basically the mockery that death is to us still, how death comes and mocks us with, mocks us in our faith yes. and tempts us to doubt the goodness of God. Yes. But that, um, you know, his, so I started, it sent me on a journey to read some of his sermons that have been so grounding for me. And he talks about like the reality is as followers of Jesus, as death is coming for us or for those we love or for our dreams that we stand, you know, death, your sting is but temporary. And in fact, Jesus has mocked you and, and the day will come when you are revealed. And then, you know, Paul says in first Corinthians 15, that, you know, death itself will be defeated. And I just, this kind of, I felt it was a both and of a recognition of like, dang it, like death still does have this temporary reach that, that is c- confusing yes. post-resurrection. Yes. yes. But it filled me with this boldness of yes. like where death reaches, it, like to say back to death. And it is, it is, it is a, a temper. It is a blink because you have been defeated and, you know, our vindication is coming. It is a resilience in the face of the death that people I love yes. are enduring. So yes. that's been a big yes. part of my last 12 to 13 years of kind of this place of like, even in the face of death, like Jesus has done something to me where I trust him. And in the face of an unanswered quote unquote prayer that Mm. I I really did feel like I was like expecting Lance to come Mm. like, um, but God's, it's not because he's, God's holding out on me and it's not because I blew it. It's because of where we are in the story and, um, our vindication is coming. 
share, I want to I want to circle back to the the part of the story that made you so vulnerable was you thought, yeah. right? That um, I think this is where a lot. I've been getting hammered. Our friends are getting hammered. I'm watching this happen Mm -hmm. in the saints right now is, but wait a second, wait a second. I thought that God was going to do something, right? That, you know, our daughter was going to get into this better school, which would be right for her learning disability. I thought that, Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to get married this year. What, wait, what? I just lots of things from small, small things. I thought this trip was going to go better. I thought you were in it, God. And, and it rained the whole time. Like what? And mm-hmm. that just happened to some friends of ours. They spent a lot of money to go away on, on a trip that they really needed, and it just rained the whole time. And and so all of that, from small to large things to death, you know, I, it's that moment of, wait a second, I, I thought for various reasons, particularly if you feel like God has spoken yep. to you that something's going to happen, and it doesn't, the phrase again in me that I'm very aware of is, come on, God. In me, I can feel it's just laden with resentment. Yeah. It, it's not the cry of the Psalms of, you know, my God, my God, where are you? That Jesus quotes on the, it, this is different. Th- this is, what the, what the? Like, I'm not sure I like you right now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I like this whole story mm. even right now. And we've been talking over the past couple of years about, the, the current movement of, of loss of faith in the world. And most of those stories are rooted in some legitimate mm-hmm. disappointment, heartache, loss, but then this other thing gets in, yep. right, uh, of resentment. Totally. The expectation to resentment and, and resentment towards God. Right. You describe it so well because it's something legitimate that opens a door, but then it's almost like there's this exponential assault that tempts to lead all of us down to this place of just total apostasy where we just it, do it, not trust God. It opens the door, Morgan, and you didn't know that behind the door is the Atlantic. Exactly. And it's just woof, like totally. all this pressure and power and force and comes in right. confirming your resentment. Totally. And so what? I think one thing we're learning is what do you do with that door? Yeah. Because now we know what's behind it. Yeah. And there is a, a supernatural power of evil that wants to use that legitimate hurt yeah. and bring in all sorts of other things. And I know it, it comes in the two main places. It's God, um, a, an assault against my belief in God and also against self. It can be very self, um, you know, uh, anger turned inward Mm. of I'm blowing Mm. it. Um, You know, I can be really hard on myself. And so both of those, I have to become Mm. really aware of those. I think one thing that's helped me tremendously is I used to define hope as anticipation and expectation of good things to come. But I realized anticipation and expectation are very different things. And one of them, the expectation can be that trap that opens the door to evil. Whereas anticipation, like you said, is is really different of of keeping your heart alive, not diminishing desire. Yes. But I think it's really important to steward those two things. And I mean, a super practical example, we're 23 years married. Congratulations, babe. Thanks, babe. Um, And we're celebrating this coming weekend. And we have learned our anniversary is in December, but we always celebrate in January because of the the swirl of December. It's too close to the holidays. So we've learned a few things. Who would get married right before Christmas? (laughs) What were they thinking? thinking? Exactly. So coming to this weekend, we are flying the kids to Pittsburgh to help care for my dad. And we're getting away for the weekend. And I'm aware that a decade ago, I would have had a lot of expectation that's legitimate. We want to celebrate. Like, and this is worthy of celebration. And, but then here's where it, it twists is it would have been, we've invested the money. We've taken this time. We're bringing need to it, right? We really need to get away. And it's so booby trapped yep. because one snowstorm, right? One, one car hits a curb a and on and cold. on it goes. A cold, A simple right? cold. Exactly. And I think what we've learned to shepherd our hearts, stay in desire, stay alive, 
we are, and we had a beautiful conversation on this yesterday where we sat down and said, here's what I'm anticipating. I am anticipating that we'll have delightful intimacy, that we'll have great conversation, that we'll be in a beautiful place that God will provide. But I am consecrating my expectation. Yes. Someone in our house has been sick every day for the the most of a month. And we know these snowstorms and canceled flights. And so I bring all those expectations under God and say, I actually consecrate mm. them. I relinquish them to you. And therefore, we are holding it really loosely because God is not on trial. And mm. that's the key piece for me is like there was a time where God was on trial and those resentments brought this indictment against God or self. And we we now know in all those things that are so valid and we just go, what the, what the? My heart is learning, practicing rest. And there are dimensions in act three that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. There's mystery. And there are things at work that are really good on our behalf mm -hmm. that we have to rest in. But it it is very tied to consecrating and relinquishing those expectations. So much in me wants to put a bow around this and bring this in for a really beautiful, clean landing where everybody's heart's in a great place. But I, I just think we have to pause. Like, that's a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. That is a lot to connect with in your own life. And I know, I know it's surfacing all kinds of stuff from friendships, relationships, kids to God. Um, I, think, I think we should pause and I think we should pray this together. Holy Spirit, catch me, catch me right now. And take me to those things that you are speaking to and just put everything else to the side. Let me not get lost in a hundred things. Holy Spirit, take me to those one or two things that you are bringing to my attention, Jesus, that you are bringing to my attention. And I invite you in. I invite you in, God. I think that's where to go today, friends. We're just going to kind of pause this right now.